Chapter 2, Taxation. The first time I took a Nolan chart quiz was during my senior year of high school. I remember three things about that quiz. It was the first time I was aware of different ideological options aside from the standard choices, conservative or liberal, right, left, or center, Republican, Democrat, or independent. I scored populist, which is no longer listed on the Nolan chart, which put me in the lower quadrant near the convergence of the centrist block and the conservative quadrant. The only question I recall was about the rich paying their fair share of taxes. At the time, I said yes. As the year progressed, I learned that the progressive tax structure does tax the rich at a higher rate. I never gave a second thought to the fact that there was no tax on income before the ratification of the 16th Amendment, and the discussion on taxation was always on the pros and cons of progressive tax, regressive tax, and or flat tax. During my senior year of high school, I came to like the idea of the flat tax. In 1999, while working as a traffic reporter for a news talk radio station, I heard Neil Bortz talk about this new proposal called Called the fair tax. I was on board and liked the idea of people being able to keep what they earn and only paying tax when they make a purchase. It was through Neil Bortz that I heard about the Libertarian Party, the world's smallest political quiz, I took the quiz and scored conservative libertarian, and the ideas of libertarianism. It was not long before I joined the LP and began learning more about the ideas of libertarianism. A few years later, after moving to Pennsylvania, I ran for town supervisor as a libertarian and, with minimal campaigning, polled 11% in a two-way race against an incumbent Democrat. I had planned to run for state representative the following year, but was asked to be the LP nominee for state treasurer. As the LP nominee for state treasurer, I said I would not write a check the state could not cash and polled just over 1%, which was higher than the Green Party and Constitution Party candidates combined. It was around this time that my support for the fair tax began to fade and I began to realize that no form of direct taxation is fair. I do like the idea of user fees, though have not found one that has been implemented by a government that was not carried out in a monopolistic, violent fashion. There are some people who say that based on the wording of the IRS, code, the average worker is not required to file a tax return. Some of those people have even gone to jail for failure to file a tax return and or pay what the IRS claims they owe. Others like to point to statistics similar to the infamous 47% figure that gained notoriety during the 2012 presidential election, which is the approximate percentage of people who do not pay federal income taxes. Most of the people who mention that statistic do so in an effort to shame those who don't pay any federal income tax. Every time I hear a statistic like this, I'm reminded of the Whitey Harrell trial. Mr. Harrell was charged with not filing an Illinois state tax return and was acquitted by the jury. Marcella Brooks, the juror that was vocal in getting the acquittal, recounts in America Freedom to Fascism that the other members of the jury said, but he'll get away with it. Mr. Harrell was acquitted because the jury was not shown the law that proved that he was required to file a federal income tax return. Millions of Americans are like the members of that jury. They're not really upset that others aren't paying. They're upset that they are. I'm not really concerned with whether or not there is a law, statute, regulation, or ordinance in place that says someone must file a tax return. I'm not concerned because there are many laws, statutes, regulations, and ordinances in place around the world that attempt to control people by forcing them to do or not do certain things. In the past, there were laws that said one human could own another human against his will, that if a slave escaped, he would be returned to his master, and that it was illegal to assist a runaway slave. Did those those laws make involuntary servitude moral? No, nor did the laws that allowed the Germans to incarcerate and murder anyone of Jewish descent make those acts any less heinous. Just because something is mandated under law does not make it right any more than a law prohibiting something makes it wrong. The real unanswered question regarding taxation is not what is someone's fair share, but rather does anyone else own the fruits of your labor? I say no. If you support the idea that everyone is equal under the law, then you believe that no person or group has more rights rights than any other person or group. For instance, I do not have the right to steal your car, thus no group, regardless of size, has a right to steal your car, though groups known as government can claim such an illegitimate right. They may never steal your car, or they might steal your car under certain circumstances, failure to register with the local DMV, too many citations for driving and or parking offenses, or simply because your car does not meet some safety standard. These are not legitimate reasons for the theft of one's transportation. 
Similarly, governments around the world claim ownership over a portion of your earnings in the form of taxation. If you fail to pay, you risk being thrown in jail and or possible death. If I attempted to take your money from you by force, it would be considered theft or extortion. It is no less theft or extortion when government does it. Knowing that taxation is theft, or at the very least extortion, how can a government operate absent this method of getting money? I believe that governments, if they are to continue existing, can operate without taxation in a similar way that your neighborhood grocer operates without taxation. Any proposed government project should be able to be funded through voluntary means. Just as your local grocer doesn't point or threaten to point a gun to your head to force you to purchase his groceries, governments should not use the same tactics to force you to fund its schools, roads, post offices, bureaucrats, regulatory agencies, military conquest, and or any other government function. This does not mean that I oppose schools, roads, and post offices. In fact, I like all three of those things and regularly use two of them. I'm opposed to the use of force to fund them. I've been a regular contributor to the arts and libraries. However, I'm opposed to the use of force to fund them. For a quick comparison between the private sector and government monopolies, let's look at the delivery of mail and packages. During the fiscal year ending September 2012, the United States Post Office had a deficit of $15.9 billion, while UPS was expecting profits of over $5 billion in fiscal year 2014. With regards to education, some statistics show that government-funded schools spend one and a half times more per student than their privately run counterparts. Private schools also hire more teachers and spend much less on administration than government-funded schools. Many museums operate almost entirely on private funding, yet they claim they will cease to exist absent the government funds they do receive. There are also free market solutions to policing and roads that currently exist and operate better than the one-size-fits-all government-controlled solutions. I admit that I do not have all the answers, though I do offer solutions. My solution to operating government without taxation is to have said government, if such would even exist in a libertarian society, rely on voluntary contributions just as privately run businesses and charities do.